Good morning, I'm Shaheen Parks. Welcome to What's Next, a seminar series presented by IBM Research in which we spend time with some of our top scientists and researchers learning about the exciting work that they're doing. Today, I'll be joined by Dr. Kayla Lee, who runs Academic Alliances with IBM Quantum. If you've been following along with our last few sessions, you'll know we've spent a lot of time delving into topics related to artificial intelligence. Today, we'll be switching gears a bit to dig into quantum computing. But rather than focusing on the what or the how of quantum, today we'll be talking a little bit more about the who. Kayla will tell us a bit about quantum computing to give us some context and help us understand why representation in this field is important at all. She'll then share with us some sobering statistics about diversity among doctoral recipients and talk to us about how these issues could be addressed. She'll then give us some perspective on the program IBM has set up with historically black colleges and universities and how it's structured to start addressing these systemic issues while quantum is still in these early stages. After Kayla's talk, we'll be joined by Dr. Michaela Amu, assistant professor at Howard University and director of the IBM HBCU Quantum Center for a discussion. If you'd like to join into our conversation, please feel free to drop your comments and questions into the chat and we'll incorporate them into our talk. With that, hey, I'll hand it I over to I have strategic Kayla. academic partnerships at IBM Quantum. I'm really excited to be with you all today to talk about how we're building an equitable quantum future with a partnership with historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs. Quantum computing is a new model of computation that leverages properties of quantum mechanics to compute information differently. Because we're at this critical point where the technology is new, we're at an extremely interesting intersection where we can start being more intentional about who's part of this technology. That includes who's building it, who's asking the questions about what problems we'll solve, and identifying potential applications. Quantum computing has a unique potential to solve problems that we can't solve today. Classical computers are really good at solving a certain amount of problems. Think about something like multiplication. There are some problems, though, that as they get bigger with scale, they become more difficult to solve. So think about something like factoring. This is a problem with as the size as it grows, it has the potential to be a really great problem for quantum computers to solve. And that's the opportunity here, solving problems that we can't solve today on classical computers. And as I mentioned before, because we're at this early point, there's a unique opportunity to be very intentional about who's part of that journey. When you think about quantum computing, there's a traditional computing stack on what different technologies, tools, and skills are required to ensure that we're following a quantum journey. At IBM, we're one of the few companies that's a full quantum computing stack. So if I start at the bottom here, you have hardware and systems. These are the actual quantum computers that you're building uh, that are needed to run quantum circuits, run pulse schedules, actually start doing things that we can't do on classical computers. Think about people like engineers and hardware physicists that are down building our systems. On top of that, you have libraries. Uh, so think about collections of circuits, templates, and pull schedules that are actually required to start interacting with the quantum computers. These are people like lower level developers uh, or control electronics. On top of that, you have your algorithms and applications. So now that we have these quantum circuits, how do we actually ensure that we're building algorithms and hybrid routines that can solve uh, real world problems? People that are focused on this stack are interested in domain applications, and they're really experts in their own fields or industries. And then on top of that, we have things like tools and services. So these are the things that go throughout the stack to ensure that there's functionality and future computing architecture and how we're actually using these tools. It's really important that at each layer in this stack, we have people that represent a, a diverse background, interests, to ensure that uh, the quantum computing stack that we build for tomorrow is more reflective of that world. At IBM, we've taken a really important stance to ensure that the quantum ecosystem and community that we're building uh, looks a little bit more like the world that we live in. So to do this, we have three main ways. The first is open access. So IBM is one of the only companies that offers real quantum computers on the cloud for public use. So if you wanted to, you could start programming a quantum computer today. The second is open source technology. So we have our own uh, software development kit called Qiskit, 
where you can use Python to program real quantum computers. And once again, these frameworks are available to everyone. Uh, and the third is a community. So we're investing in a global and diverse community of students, researchers, educators, and developers to ensure that this quantum technology that we're building is more inclusive. But we know that access alone isn't enough to ensure that these niche technology fields look slightly different. Uh, and so because of that, we're exploring new opportunities, programs, and partnerships to ensure that the world we're building uh, looks a little bit different. So one group in particular that I want to call out are historically black colleges or universities. So here on my chart, I have a, a few things. At the bottom, you can see the size of institutions. Uh, on this, the y-axis, you have the number of black or African Americans that have received uh, doctorate degrees, uh, where these were their original institutions. So it's known that HBCUs are a top contributor of people that go on to receive their doctorate degrees. Uh, and so what's really interesting here is that you can actually see that they're at an outsized rate, uh, producing a high number of Black students that go on to receive their doctorate degrees. So in fact, the schools in purple, which are non-HBCUs, although they're very large in size, uh, the number of students that they contribute to that go on to get their PhDs is much lower. At the top of the chart, you see uh, two universities that are really outpacing in the production of Black PhD students, and that's Spelman College, which is a small all-women's school in Atlanta, Georgia, and Howard University, which is located in Washington, D.C. Because of this, we know that HBCUs represent a really unique group and talent pool to start partnering with more as we start thinking about the skills needed to grow and build the quantum workforce. Now, when you start to ask the question, why do the numbers look the way they do? Uh, the American Institute of Physics produced a report uh, over the past few years that highlighted five main factors as to why underrepresented students, especially black students in STEM, uh, aren't like the numbers of their counterparts. So the first two reasons are belonging and physics identity. So we know that fostering a sense of belonging is extremely critical for success and how African-American students perceive themselves and how they're perceived by others as future scientists is extremely important in their success. So that includes starting in the field, but also staying in the field. The second is academic and personal support. Uh, so these include the things that are really necessary for students to be successful. That includes academic support, tutoring, uh, but also finances and socioeconomic status. The third is just leadership and structures. So the environments that students are in, the policies, the structures uh, really need to be redefined to ensure that they're creating an environment that's maximized for student success. So as we started to build this partnership with HBCUs, we thought about two things. The first was that chart and the fact that HBCUs contribute at a high number uh, to Black students in STEM. And the second were these five factors on why the numbers haven't changed. And with that, we formed a program that really focused on three main pillars. The first is building community and fostering a sense of belonging. HBCUs are already really great uh, at ensuring that students have culture and feel like they belong in a community. So we wanna to continue to, to leverage that as we're working with students and faculty. The second is support. So how can we provide graduate students and undergraduate students uh, with the resources, the training, and the tools that they need to ensure that they're successful in the field? Uh, and the final is connect. So how do we build bridges to the quantum research experts in the community and our HBCU faculty and students to ensure that they're engaged and active participants in the quantum future that we're building? So with all of this, we came to the IBM HBCU Quantum Center, which brings together a network of students, researchers, and faculty at HBCUs to build research and education capabilities in quantum computing. Within the program, IBM is providing access to our quantum computers on the cloud, educational support for learning quantum computation, and faculty and student support for quantum research. What's been exciting about this is not only have we seen great excitement within IBM, but within the broader quantum community and the HBCU community, as they're all starting to ask the question, like, what do we need to do? What skills do we need to develop? to be active and intentional about how the quantum future is built. Within the center, we now have 23 schools 
which you can see dotted along the east and southern region. They're all arranged in different regions, which all have their own research focus areas. For us, we hope that as the ecosystem continues to build and develop, interactions within the center and their regions will continue to grow, but also interactions within the broader quantum community. So something that's really unique about HBCUs are where they're located. If you were to put this map on top of some of the other quantum computing centers in the world, they're in other places. So it's really important that we start to be intentional about building some of those relationships and connections. Within the center, we have several programs focused around research, faculty development, and student engagement. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll call out a few of my favorites. So the first is the Quantum Coalition Undergraduate Research Scholar Program. This program brings together 30 undergraduate students. They're each paired with faculty researchers at the HBCUs uh, and then assigned a research project. Uh, in this project, they're exposed to quantum computers. They learn a little bit of the theory. Uh, they're writing code on the technology. Uh, and then after that, they're encouraged to apply to conferences, summer quantum programs. And then hopefully the goal is that they're then placed in postgraduate institutions to continue their quantum research. The second is our Quantum Information Science Invited Seminar Series. Uh, so in this, we bring together experts from the quantum community uh, and our faculty and researchers at HBCUs uh, to create a forum for them to talk about research and programs uh, that they're all working in. It's been a really great way for faculty to know things that are happening within the community, uh, but also for the community to know about the research that our faculty is taking part in. Now, when it comes to actually measuring success of this program, we think about impact on four dimensions and a bit of a stepwise function. So the first is student engagement. How do we just get students excited and engaged about quantum computing? And once they're excited, they know they have a place they can go to learn more. The second is talent development. So what steps do we need to take to train students so that it's impactful? The third is workforce development. So now that we've introduced students to this technology, how are career trajectories actually impacted by these experiences? And the final thing is research capacity. So how do we strengthen research efforts to ensure that we're building programs that don't just last for the next few months or years, but really as the quantum market continues to mature and develop? We launched in September 2020, uh, and since then we've had a few really exciting things that I want to share with you all today. The first is that North Carolina A&T was awarded almost a million dollars from the NSF in partnership with a program called QSTEAM uh, to actually build undergraduate curriculum. Uh, the goal here is to build modular undergraduate curriculum really designed for lower resource institutions with the hope that we can start building our quantum ready workforce. The second uh, is Norfolk State was recently awarded uh, an NSF grant that's focused on quantum material science. So this is another really cool example of how faculty have uh, been working with the center, but also kind of defining their own research programs in a way that's aligned with uh, the quantum goals. And finally, in partnership with SPIE, we recently launched the IBM SPIE HPC Faculty Accelerator Award. In this award, it's really geared at how do we start expanding not just quantum computing, but quantum optics and photonics for faculty members at the school. We're really excited that in March, we'll be announcing our second round of this award. So looking forward, we're already really proud of the success that we've done. We've built a community of over 500 students, faculty, and researchers. Uh, we've had few publications, lots of conferences, and we're really excited to start building best practices and lessons for how we think the IBM HBCU Quantum Center uh, can provide future guidance, advice uh, on what it looks like to bring quantum computing to not just HBCUs, but other minority serving institutions, community college, uh, and in general, just lower resource institutions. Thank you. Kayla, thanks so much for that thoughtful overview. As I mentioned at the beginning, we'll now be joined by Dr. Michaela Mu, Assistant Professor at Howard University, and also the Director of the IBM HBCU Quantum Center. Dr. Mu, thanks so much for joining us today. 
Could you tell us a little bit about your role? So um, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me. Uh, I'm the director of the center. Primarily my job is to make sure that the faculty um, and all participants, the undergraduates and graduate students, uh, have access to all of the resources that the IBM Quantum Club can offer. Um, we also arrange um, training and career development work, uh, workshops for the faculty uh, and also for the graduate students. And we make sure that the undergraduates have um, a set program so that we know that once they've been through the program as an, as an IBM HBCU Quantum Center Fellow, that they all have a set skill set and we challenge them to apply the skills that we teach them to um, the research that they're working with their advisors. So I basically facilitate that. Well, that sounds like a really important role. Could you tell us a little bit more about any specific work either that the faculty do are doing or that the students are doing in this field? So um, I'll talk about my, my research for a little bit. So, um, you know, I'm primarily a hardware engineer and I um, dived into the quantum world because AMO scientists kept coming to me and saying, hey, we need a really fast control system for our experiments. Can you design one for us? Um, and that kind of evolved into convergent research. And one of the primary problems that we have is that we have to compute a lot of data across frequency and different time scales and different types of equipment, different types of lasers. Uh, and we have to form it all into one coherent uh, control system. Um, and everybody's really interested in machine learning. Um, but one of the things is machine learning algorithms take a great deal of computational time uh, and often don't converge to an optimal solution. So my research uh, that I actually participate with in the center is the development of um, quantum test beds for machine learning algorithms. And the goal is so we can have machine learning algorithms that one can deal with non-deterministic uh, type of problems, real world problems where chance uh, and unknown factors come into play. And of course, the second goal is to speed up computation so that we can give the AMO scientists real time control systems. But in the center, we have a very diverse set of research. So we go from um, quantum biology all the way to um, electromechanics. Uh, and we have uh, about six or seven different faculty at different institutions working on very diverse problems. In fact, uh, North Carolina A&T is actually working on STEM education, particularly for the quantum workforce. So it sounds like rather than necessarily just drawing people who have an interest in quantum computing in and of itself, you're able to assemble people who are interested in a wide variety of problems and challenges and apply quantum computing as a tool to help them further their knowledge in these areas. Um, is that fair to say? Uh, that is fair to say because most of the problems in the quantum world right now can't simply be solved by quantum computing. They require convergence. So we need um, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, physicists, st statisticians. We also need like sociologists and uh, psychologists because one of the really interesting things is how do students actually form an identity as a quantum engineer? How do the faculty form an identity as a quantum engineer? what sort of training and best practices um, helps to form a sustainable program, especially under resourced um, institutions. So we tend to take a convergence approach where we kind of partner people together who have similar interests and they might be in, in different fields, but the problem solution is found at the intersection of those fields. It sounds like that really, it makes a lot of sense and Kayla, I was wondering if you feel like that's really where the program sort of steps in and starts to fill that need. Uh, absolutely. So in general, a lot of HBCUs might not have been doing quantum information science research for the past 40 years, like an IBM. Uh, and so being able to take fields uh, that have adjacent interest or are even doing supporting technology is really important as we start asking what do we need to do to build the workforce uh, and so i actually think a lot of the schools we're working with are good examples of i was thinking about traditional material science how might this apply to quantum materials and so that's what i'm really excited about doing more of like those fields that are close uh, and getting them more into quantum michaela would you agree that that's sort of the the niche that 
this partnership is really helping foster? Absolutely, because we have a lot of centers of excellence and um, really strong expertise at HBCUs, at MSIs, you know, minority seven uh, institutions in general. But there's a resource gap, right? So somebody might be really strong in um, uh, mechanical engineering and auto mechanics, but they don't really have the resources to conduct an experiment in the quantum realm. And so by putting various fields together, one, we form a really strong network and partnerships where there's collaborations between different types of institution, but we also encourage, you know, our researchers to think out of the box and kind of come together to find that solution that's at the intersection. That's fantastic. So I know the program is relatively new. Um, and so, you know, I think it sounds like you're seeing some early measures of success. And I'd love to hear more about, you know, what those are and how they're playing out. But I'd also be interested in both of your perspectives on kind of a long-term view for the program. Say we look out 10 years from now, how will we know that the program is achieving the goals that we hope to? Sure. Maybe yeah. I'll start with some early wins. Uh, one of the really cool things about bringing a really big corporate partner like IBM uh, with HBCUs together is we have a very different reach. Uh, so I think about HBCUs as being on the ground. They're great at working with different types of students. Like I said, along that map, there are those different geographical regions that they represent. Uh, and IBM has like the voice. Uh, so two years ago when we first launched, we got this really excited email from a student that was like, hey, I, I heard about this. Like, how do I get started? Uh, since then, he's been an intern at IBM. Like, he's still continuing his quantum research. And so just knowing that from some of our marketing and our different efforts, we've been able to introduce people to quantum, bring them into IBM to work, uh, to me is an example of a really exciting near-term one. Uh, and I would like to do more of that, right? Like ensuring that once a student says, oh, I'm interested in quantum computing, that they know they have IBM and the sensor to go to, uh, faculty members to go to, uh, and honestly start thinking that HBCUs might be a great place to start their quantum career. To me, that's a great like near-term one. Uh, Long-term, I'm definitely interested in really changing what the workforce looks like. And so it starts small. You start to see more students and faculty represented at conferences. You see it in publication records. Uh, but over time, I think it's how many quantum information science, quantum computing specific faculty are teaching at these institutions. How are programs being built at these institutions? What schools are really feeders into some of the other like PhD masters and in industry uh, workforce? So that's what I'm thinking about long term. What about you, Michaela? So we've seen some really good successes. So in the first year of the program, uh, I started a very small undergraduate research team. Uh, and of that five member team, two of them actually stayed on uh, for graduate school to continue the, the research that we were doing. So uh, Robert started uh, last fall, so he's a first year PhD student and Erin returns this fall uh, to the PhD program. Um, as part of the funding, another electrical engineering student has been working over in um, physics uh, with one of our uh, faculty members, uh, Sagata Chowdhury. Uh, and she's so excited about the research that she's also going to join the graduate program in August. So, I mean, right there within like a year of the program, we've already got three undergraduates who normally would never have considered like a quantum uh, research sort of PhD, who are now well and truly uh, committed to quantum, you know, engineering and, and you know, using that for the, for the dissertation topic. Um, we also see other things, for instance, um, you know, Sagata and I collaborated uh, on a grant with Northeastern. That was a great collaboration. We won a grant from the, from the DOD. These are all short-term successes that have happened in like the first 18 months of the program. Uh, we have students from universities such as Coppin State and um, Morgan State uh, and NCAT who are actually working with advisors at different schools. So we're also starting to form networks across different schools. And of course now this year, we're starting to see more conference publications uh, and our faculty are really going out there and making the names known. So I think in the first 18 months of the, of the program, we've had quite a few successes and it's exciting. That's really inspiring here. So we have a question from one of our audience members 
about the relationship between quantum computing and IBM power systems. Kayla, is that something that you can comment on? Uh, sure. So IBM power systems, uh, one of our big brands at IBM, uh, right now I think of them as kind of separate. Mm -hmm. uh, so quantum computers are absolutely in their developmental state. Uh, we're focused on building processors, building the systems and the tools that we need. Uh, down the line, we are thinking about things like how might they integrate with existing architectures. Uh, but for now, uh, the focus is build quantum computers, make them accessible specifically on the IBM cloud. Uh, and then I think we can talk a bit, little bit later about how that integrates with Power Z and some of our other more uh, computing systems. All in the works. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, we are coming to the end of our time, but I want to open this up for kind of a big picture question. You know, we've talked a lot about all these efforts and kind of allocating resources to where they can be most effective. Um, but really, the I want to turn it back to just just ask both of you: Why is this so hard? This is a known problem. It's not a new problem. You know, what? Why? Why are we still struggling so much? So one of the things that I think about a lot is how did I get involved in science? Uh, I was super lucky. I had a dad that worked at IBM uh, and a mom that was a computer scientist and that really jump-started my career and my interest. I think for a lot of other people, it's willing to ask, like, how do you find out about the career that you do? Mm -hmm. uh, if it's something like quantum computing, which is there's a very small community, you need to have a certain level of background to even understand how to engage, <laughs> right? Like we're talking about a lot of barriers to entry and that's early on when I'm just thinking about a career, but that's not once I actually get in the field and then like I'm discouraged from continuing it because the way I look, maybe my gender, maybe my identity. And so there are a lot of different things that have to move at the same time so that we can start seeing an impact. Uh, and to be honest, I think it's hard to know where to start. And so what I hope is that the center starts to introduce a few examples of like what that could look like. Maybe it's a really cool campaign on YouTube where we're talking <laughs> about the center. Uh, maybe it's a, a paper or a conference where we're reaching different people. But I do think we have to ask the question, like how do we engage uh, and excite different audiences? And I don't think it's, it's super easy, especially when you think about what the field looks like today uh, compared to what we want it to look like tomorrow. I mean, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Michaela, do you want to comment? Um, so I, I'll just piggyback on what, what um, Kayla said. So as we said before, there are a lot of expertise that HBCUs and minority serving institutions. Unfortunately, they are resource strapped, right? So, you know, let's say you have a student, they're really interested in AMO. There are very few HBCUs that can, you know, invest a million or $2 million for a startup lab. Cost is a huge barrier to entry in certain parts of, you know, quantum computing, which is why it's so great that the IBM, you know, have this huge quantum cloud. Um, but one of the things I would like to see is for industry to be very intentional in their engagements with MSIs and start thinking about things like, can we build a lab? We have center of expertise here. We have the faculty of expertise, the students of expertise. You know, can we can we build a lab, right? Can we give more money uh, that can be freely used for faculty startup? You know, another thing is that, you know, faculty at minority serving institutions are overworked, right? There's few resources, they have a high teaching load, and somehow they have to teach with excellence, and they also have to conduct research, train undergrads, and train graduate students, right? And so another thing that I'd like to see from both government and industry is, as I say, some very intentional partnerships where they actually look at, you know, maybe funding a, you know, a faculty buyout, like 50% buyout, right? so that the faculty have money to hire somebody else so that they can concentrate on the research, write papers, train undergraduates. And then the other real important thing, I think, is the question of engineering identity. How do undergraduates and graduate students build that engineering identity as a quantum scientist, right? Where they feel at home in the existing kind of uh, field with existing researchers when they go to primarily white institutions, right? And we have to look at best practices and methodology to help 
the undergraduates and the graduate students kind of build that core identity and confidence so that when they go to conferences or when they go out into the workforce, you know, they feel confident, they feel like experts, they feel like they belong in the field. Because if you feel like you don't belong and you're always on the outside looking in, it's kind of very difficult to, to, to build a workforce. So I think that's most important. I mean, I couldn't agree more with all of what you've both just said. So thank you so much. And thanks for participating with us today in this whole conversation. It's been so informative and interesting. And I hope that it's been illuminating for a lot of members of our audience as well. And thank you, audience members, for joining us today. If you would like to learn more about the programs we talked about, about quantum computing in general, there's some links on the YouTube uh, page. And I also wanted to mention, if you were paying close attention to Kayla's slides, you may have noticed a researcher featured in the lab in one of her last slides. That's Dr. Micah Takita, who will be featured on our next What's Next session talking about quantum error correction. So I hope that you'll join us then.